today's Friday Transportation Seminar. My name is Aaron Golub, and I'll be introducing and moderating today's seminar. Our Friday Transportation Seminars have been a tradition since the year 2000. Uh, these seminars are once again being held live here on Portland State University's urban campus, located on the ancestral homelands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, and Wallala bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin, Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It is important to acknowledge that we are here because of the sacrifices forced on the indigenous ancestors to place, remember these communities and honor their legacy, lives, and descendants. Today we are pleased to have Miles Crumley presenting on moving from probabilistic to time-based on-time performance. Miles Crumley uh, is a master of science in the MS, the manager of service performance and analysis at TriMet, where he oversees internal and external reporting and data analysis for fixed route bus, light rail, and commuter rail services. Starting out as a bus operator in 2013, Miles worked in various analytical positions at the agency, and his contributions informed design on division transit project and a better brand. Miles holds a graduate degree in system science and psychology and an undergraduate degree in physics and psychology from PSU. Here is a preview of our remaining uh, speaker in the fall speakers in the fall series, which is just in two weeks from now. An overview of today's seminar. You can expect our um, you can expect our speaker to present for about 40 minutes, followed by Q&A. We will be receiving questions through the Q&A feature on your control panel, and we'll ask them at the end of the presentation. If we run out of time for all your questions, we will give our speaker the opportunity to email written responses for any questions left unanswered. We have enabled closed captioning. You must click on the closed captioning feature on your control panel to view them. We'll be recording today's seminar. will be available on our website later today, along with the presentation slides. If you're tracking professional development hours, this webinar is eligible for one hour of continuing education credit. With that, I'll hand it over to Miles. Hi, good morning. Let's steal this. Infinity. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, so good morning. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Miles Crumley. I work for TriMet. Uh, today, uh, so naming things is hard. And so when uh, Dr. Dill originally came to me and was like, hey, would you like to talk at one of our Friday seminars? I was like, sure. What do you want to talk about? And I was like, uh, well, I've been bouncing around this idea. And so we kind of talked about it on the phone. And then next, you know, I made a presentation. So I'll warn you right now, this is a, a work in progress. I don't actually have all the details here, but I figured since I'm around a bunch of current, future transportation professionals, perhaps I can lean on you to give me some insights. So uh, again, uh, I'm the manager of service performance and analysis here at TriMet. Here's a quick introduction of what we'll be talking about today. I will be mindful of the time to make sure that we do stop. I will stop talking at the end of 40 minutes. And so if we're getting close, just like, hey, stop talking. Uh, so I'll give a quick introduction of myself. Uh, I'll talk about on-time performance and give a definition as it's actually stated in the literature. There is actually a literature definition of on-time performance. I found it. Uh, I'll talk about some of the challenges that I have with this particular metric. Uh, I'm going to propose a new definition or a new way of actually conceptualizing uh, on-time performance. I have real data because I work at a transit agency. And as Tammy pointed out, I can't go anywhere without offering somebody some data. And so I do actually <laughs> have data. Uh, it's actually really timely because I took FX2, which apparently is what everybody wants to know about. So I have FX2 data. And uh, I'll talk about some limitations here. Uh, so yeah, here's a picture of me. Uh, so yeah, I went to Portland State. I started out at a small liberal arts college on the east side of town called Reed College. Went there for two years. Uh, after leaving Reed, I came to Portland State where uh, I actually worked in the physics department, believe it or not. Uh, so I did that. Um, 
Eventually got into, I was actually gonna go to medical school, but in a roundabout way, I actually ended up uh, studying system science. So uh, Wayne Wakelin was my advisor. And if you're familiar with Wayne, he knows who I am. Uh, anyways, uh, my approach is mainly uh, looking at uh, things from a system science perspective. And so it's not necessarily about the whole thing, but it's understanding the interactions that are in between the actual thing that you're studying. For those of you not familiar with system science, System science, all it is, is a set of tools to explain how things work. It doesn't matter the system, it's just a set of tools. And so sometimes at work, I won't say it explicitly, but I was like, oh, this is like a biological cell transport thing that we're doing with people getting on and off buses. And, you know, half the people in the meeting, their eyes glaze over a few people that are like, yeah, I agree with that. That's what we try to do with system science. Uh, other things that I've done, I did drive a bus at one point in time. I don't have a picture of it. I can't find it. Uh, it is of me in a uniform, but I'm not actually in the seat. But I do have proof <laughs> that I did drive a bus at one point in time. People do that. Yes. Uh, I managed the uh, service performance and analysis department at TriMet. Uh, we're responsible for uh, internal and external reporting uh, to federal internal agencies. I give out data to researchers that want data. I write on research projects. Uh, we make improvements to the agency to help transportation. Uh, and yeah, I've published a couple papers. If you're going to TRB in January, you might see. All right, so let's jump into the, the fun part. So on-time performance. So what is on-time performance? So I did actually go back and look in, uh, in the transportation research record. Uh, there's this paper from 1987, and it defines on-time performance as the following. So, on-time performance is defined as a bus arriving, passing, or leaving a predetermined bus stop along its route within a time period that is no more than X minutes earlier and no more than Y minutes later than a published scheduled time. The values of X and Y vary across the transit industry. However, one minute and five minutes are the most common values used informally for X and Y respectively, okay? That's what on-time performance is defined as, okay? And so I have this model here where essentially when we calculate on-time performance, we use this kind of betting model. We take each bus and we say, where are you here? And then we put you here. And then we take the next bus and we say, where are you here? You're here. And then we say, this is a percentage. And so from there, the customer or the, the passenger on the bus is supposed to say, probabilistically, this bus is on time this much. What does that mean? Okay, so in the definition, we talked about that there's variances between agencies. So I met, uh, again, I found there's a lot of presentations online about on-time performance. Perhaps <laughs> me challenging this isn't too far outside the box, okay? TriMet uses one minute early and five minutes late. I will cite, quote to you the actual on-time performance policy here in a second, because I do have it memorized. But you will know from up here, there are other agencies that use different metrics. My favorite is WMATA. You can be seven minutes past a partner and actually be able to still be considered on time. That means that bus arriving is plus or minus 10 minutes. Really? Is that really good for the customer to actually have service? No. Uh, knowing what I know about WMATA, I agree. Okay. <laughs> But each one of these agencies, they all have different values that we actually use for on-time performance. But when you look at the definition, you would assume that perhaps it's one in five minutes, but that's actually not true. It actually varies agency to agency. I actually don't know if this is published anywhere external for the public to actually see what actual different agencies mentioned. <laughs> so then we present these things as probabilities. Right, and so I did find this slide. I did not pick this one intentionally, but somehow TriMet ended up at the top. Where during this period in 2018, we had 75 percent on-time performance. What does that mean? Right. So basically, three out of four buses are on time within six minutes. But which buses? How are you actually supposed to be able to plan where you want to go if all you're given is this this specific probability? And meanwhile, we run 72 routes-ish, right? So total, they're all 75% on time. Has anybody used transit lately? Does that really match your reality of how this actual works? Right. And so moving away from this actual probabilistic statement and actually moving to a time base, as it's in the you know, words of on-time performance, now gives a customer the ability to understand 
what does this actually mean when my bus is, quote, on time, and how far off on time is it? So, big challenge that I have with this is that, again, we're just looking at probabilities that a vehicle arrives at a certain time point within this range, okay? If you want to make on-time performance better, you just take this and move it over there. Great. Now I have 100% on-time performance. But again, what does that mean? Does that really mean that every vehicle is on time within some set threshold? No. It just means that on average, this is where essentially we end up. And so our agency, we do report this out. A lot of agencies report out on-time performance metrics. But I, with the direction that I'm moving uh, within our department, is taking the metrics and actually putting them in a way that makes them usable to people that need to make decisions. Okay. If I told you we're 75% on time, what decision are you going to make when you go out to leave your house when the bus shows up 10 minutes late? Right? Is that now you're going to have a discussion of, wait a minute, so are you really 75% on time? Okay. Anyways. So, other issues that I have uh, with on time performance. So, the big one is if you're 100% on time, then what? So, do we as a transit agency? We're done. Great. We hit the mission. We're at 100%. Now we'll all go home. Right? There's nowhere to go once you actually hit that particular metric. And so, moving away from that actual probability and actually looking at a time value gives you something that you can actually manipulate. I'll come back to that. Uh, does the does this allow you to identify where you have problems with providing on-time departures? This right here is a part that I find that there's some inconsistency with what we mean when we mean on-time performance. So I'll just pull the room very quickly. When I say on-time performance, do you are you thinking of the vehicle arriving or departing? Okay. Arriving. arriving. Okay. Anybody else want to be in the departing group? Okay, we've got a couple. So on TriMet's website, and you don't you don't have to, you can fact check me on this. If you go out to a stop that actually has the big white sheet that has the schedule, on the bottom, it states that this is the time the vehicle will depart that stop. Okay, so now the question is, is does everybody actually measure this as a departure or an arrival? And does it matter, right? If I know that the vehicle is going to depart at a certain time, that adjusts my behavior is if I thought the vehicle was going to arrive at a certain time, okay? And try that the times that you see are departure times. They're not arrival times, okay? And so now when you're trying to go catch that bus, you actually have to be there before the thing departs because it's not gonna arrive at that time if the wheels are already returning based on the time that's actually printed on the schedule. And that's not just me saying it, that's what we were trained as operators to do. Is that when the clock says zero, 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 the door is closed and the bus is moving, right? The person running, they missed your bus. But here in Portland, I would pick you up. <laughs> Except for the one time, I, okay, I won't do bus tours. All right. Uh, the targets are arbitrary and they vary from agency to agency, okay? And so because of that, we don't have a consistent way to actually measure on time performance, not only between agencies, but perhaps between industries. Okay, airlines use on-time performance. It's a departure time. Okay, no one cares on the plane arrive. Well, some of us do if you have to make a connection. But other than that, if it's a one-way trip, I mean, the plane arrives when it lands, right? Uh, and then my other favorite one is, what is an actual good on-time performance value? 80%, 75%, 10%? It depends, right? Some service you run, you might want it to be late. Okay, so for instance, if you have a route that is, say, has a 12-minute uh, headway, and that route goes by a high school, and that high school, the high school kids, they use that bus, you might want to actually insert other vehicles within there to maintain the 12-minute on-time performance headway. However, you will have other vehicles providing a narrower headway, but they're going to be late, and that's basically solving a capacity problem but ignoring the actual on-time performance of the 12-minute headway buses that you really actually want to be on time, okay? That's hidden in the percentage. And so what I'm trying to do is actually disaggregate that, taking this actual system science approach. Uh, man, I really put a lot of slides in here. Okay, so uh, how can you mitigate actual on-time performance without actually talking about time? All right, so 
I'm going to propose a new definition. So the way that I look at on-time performance is essentially it's the average deviation from schedule measured at time points for all trips and service provided in a route and direction. Okay. Now this point right here is kind of controversial where we talk about all trips and service provided because some agencies ignore trips that don't go out, right? And so if you have a canceled trip, say for instance, operator doesn't show, you don't have equipment to provide that trip, that vehicle does not enter into service. However, you still have an on-time performance value. So do you divide by zero? Do you penalize the on-time performance with an entire headway because that, that trip was missed? How do you actually account for lost service? Okay. It has an impact, and I will actually show you that impact here in a second. Further, you're taking the system science approach, and it says we also consider other impacts to the actual time limits to get a better idea of what is the on-time performance. And you have to consider what's actually going on within the, the actual operation and give the operators credit for actually providing this level of service. What I mean by that is when we write a schedule and we say, hey, operators, go operate this schedule. We all, I assume like in school, we all learned about guess and check, right? Right, okay. So in a transit agency, that's all we do all day long is that we say, hey, I need to go from PSU to, let's use a better example. I need to go from uh, OHSU to, uh, Decom in the 15th, right? I'm on the 8th. I know that I'm going to have a, a line between there and here. And I'm going to put some buses on there. I have no idea what type of schedule to write. So I write a schedule. And then I realize out there, there's like a lot of people on this route, right? <laughs> so my guess was wrong. So now I got to add more service. And I got to add more service. And then when it gets to that point where things become comfortable, I check it off the list and I move on to the next thing. That's what we do all day long at the transit agency. It's a guess and check. Some are better guessing at others. But we have to try new things to actually understand what's going on. So when we write this schedule, the operator, when they actually deliver that on-time performance, that is their best ability to write, to operate a schedule that we wrote. And so in a way, that is the check. If the operators are always late on the schedule, it might not be the operator's fault. If it could be our fault because our guesses are incorrect. So there's other things that we can do to actually get the on-time performance within a range that we actually find acceptable. And it's a numerical range, not a percentage. So I argue that we should disaggregate on-time performance and take into consideration the actual operating environment that the bus actually operates in. And so for this, my, my uh, we don't call them tools, the, the uh, systems method that I'm pulling from, it's basically an accounting method. Okay, so I'm just basically breaking down what are the components that actually make up the values that are within this large box, okay? So the ones that I started to focus in on, and there were several, several more, but when you start doing data analysis, at some point, you have to start writing the paper. And so I had to start writing the presentation. So I'm going to focus in on observed ridership, uh, stop service, which is basically the number of stops that we serve and how much time we spend actually servicing those stops. Uh, the number of times ramps are deployed, this is a question I get constantly from planners is how often are ramps being deployed and how long does this take? I have to tell them ramp deployments, it's the cost of doing business. They're infrequent activities and they really don't take that long because they're so infrequent. And so focusing here, especially from a capital side, we'll get back to that. You might not save as much as you think, okay? And then the last thing is service delays because these are all things that some of them we do have control over. But there's other ways that we respond to these particular attributes that lead to certain types of behavior. All right. Then we have to have a new target, right? Because now we're no longer talking about these 85, 90% thresholds. My new target, or the way that I look at this, is that the goal is to be as close to zero, zero, zero as possible, right? If you can only get to one minute pass, then that's good enough, right? But the idea here is that you have to, that there's always a trade off when you're designing something of how much money are you really going to spend to make sure that it's always at zero, zero, zero versus what is actually acceptable for what the public actually needs. Okay. And so I argue that you should just be as close to zero, zero, zero on time. That's what our policy states. All right. So uh, when you have data, it's always nice to tell the story. And so essentially, I'm going to now present to you the actual data that I have to, to 
uh, back up this new way that I'm proposing it by actually telling a story of one of our particular rounds. I won't put it just like 10 more times. So using FX2 data, this is uh, from open, day of opening service. It's weekdays only. Uh, so it's September 19th through uh, last Friday. Uh, I only looked at the corridor going from downtown to Gresham. If you look in the opposite direction, it's basically the on-time performance is really, really great, 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 bad, 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 great, 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 great. In the opposite direction, it goes great, 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 bad, 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 great, great, great. So why do it in both directions? It's the same. Uh, within this area, there are six time point segments. And this is important because I broke this out to say, what is the behavior that occurs within these actual time point segments? Time point segment is basically, as I have here, one would be from North uh, 5th and Hoyt to 5th and Salmon, 5th and Salmon and Chavez, Chavez 82nd, 82nd, 122nd, then 162nd. Gresham Transit Center isn't on there because it's the end of the line. So, no one cares about that diversion. <laughs> I, I, sorry, let me rephrase it. I ignored it within the analysis. Yeah. The thing is with the bending buses, right? Yes, these are, yeah, these are the uh, articulated buses uh, out on FX. Now, there is, a, there is a caveat here that I will point out. So uh, this date range, you will know, there was an article in the newspaper that says that the, the actual articulated buses are out of service. So this data is both 60 foot and 40 foot service all mashed together. Anecdotally, the buses are still fast. They just can't carry as many people. And there's a, another one with all the reporting. But again, we're going to do some hand wavy, put it over there. Uh, and then, uh, so what I did was I took each one of these corridors, I calculated the actual on time performance within each one, I stacked them all together, and then I actually calculated an overall on time performance within each one of the segments. They're all interlinked. And so you have to, if you have bad performance here, the operator has a very hard job to get on time here, okay? And so that's why it's just said stack them all together because this impact does have an impact downstream. All right, so look at some data. It's gonna be like data, all right? So uh, I wrote this out by headway. I didn't wanna do it by time of day because it starts to get a little bit messy and then the chart is just 30 rows or 24 hours of service. And so I just said, let's look at all the trips that are provided within certain headways. We run different headways based on time of day. And so headway is my proxy to actually represent time of day. We run 12 minute service all day. So this is the base, okay? In the peaks, it'll get as fast as six minutes. And at nights, it might be as, as long as 20 minutes, okay? But essentially this is the range that we're looking for. I will draw your attention here. At 12 minutes, this is where we're moving the largest volume of people. Okay, and so this is total ridership during that actual time period, and this is the average on time performance of all the time segments combined. And so we're moving 67,000 people, and on average, they're late three and a half minutes, or three minutes and 50 seconds. Okay, is that good? That wasn't rhetorical. <laughs> is it? It's not as bad. It's not as bad. Okay. <laughs> it's not as bad, you know, considering the sexual ridership. If you look at these other ones, right? So here you have a bus that's on time two and a half minutes, and they're only moving about 4,600 people. This bus is four and a half minutes late on average, and you're only moving about 2,000 people. So you're like, hmm, that's interesting. And then you come up here to this nice six minute headway where they're just almost as late as this bus, but they're moving a fraction of the people. And so now it's like, well, wait a minute. Are these other headways really doing anything to actually help the service? Or are they actually impeding this 12 minute headway? Um, we'll keep going. So these segments here, uh, this 13 minute headway, the 11 minute and the eight minute headway, those are areas that I, as a practitioner, would actually investigate further. But if I just put up 75%, none of these questions would be asked. And so that's why I'm arguing, you have to actually disaggregate what's going on between each segment to better understand how can you actually mitigate these, okay? For me, I wouldn't do anything about this because the service is still new and perhaps this headway will get better or there's a reason why the headway is support. So let's keep digging. So now we look at stop service. 
And so what this is looking at is that within each time point segment, how many stops are actually, do we actually stop and provide service to, okay? Sometimes we have these very long routes. Route may have say 50 bus stops, but we really only serve maybe 20 of them, okay? And so those other bus stops, they really don't count in your overall on-time performance. They're really just areas for the operator if it's safe to lay over if they actually happen to be running ahead of schedule, okay? So there is a benefit to having a lot of bus stops. It provides safe areas for buses to get out of traffic if they're running early. But what we'll see here though, is that for this 12-minute uh, headway, again, we're serving mainly four stops. I believe in that corridor, there are actually four stops. So that means that at this 12-minute headway, we're hitting every single platform, and on average, it's taking about 18 seconds per stop to provide service, okay? Is that good or bad? Well, when you look at it in the context of these two down here, you're serving three stops, which is close to four. But wait a minute, this is taking you five seconds faster. Why is that? Right? Here, you're having, your headway here is so great. Is it a passenger loading thing? Well, I don't know. I mean, you're moving maybe a fraction of the people above, but that seems kind of different, right? How, why is this now taking you five seconds longer compared to the average of 18 seconds? It's an area that we have to investigate further. Is it the operator? Is it the platform? Is it the operator's ability to get into the platform? Is it customers that don't understand the schedule and they're always running to the bus? I don't know. But just if I told you 5% late, what does that mean, right? So and then when, when a bus is delayed, it tells a message to the driver that is going late and to go faster or it's over, no? It's no, so the driver to decide. Correct, so the, the operator is in full control of the schedule. We do have some technology to actually manage headways. The challenge though is that if you tell somebody to go faster, the probability that they get into a collision increases. And so you don't wanna tell people to go faster you actually have to slow the entire line down. And so now the, all the service begins to degrade or you have to insert new service in order to actually maintain that headway. And so it's very difficult to tell an operator to drive faster, right? And sometimes you just physically cannot. Now I did do some previous analysis on this and this was actually related to FX2 where I actually calculated what is the average boarding and alighting time on one of our vehicles. And I found that on average on a 40 foot coach, single door boarding, uh, boarding took about five to seven seconds. This is pre hop. So this is somebody steps on money into the machine. They get to a stable platform on the bus. A stable platform is not in a seat. The stable platform is your hand is on the first stanchion bar once you pass the area for mobility devices. That is a stable platform. I also looked at a lighting time. This is both doors and it was less than a second. So if it's only the person who's just aligning the vehicle, it takes less than a second for them to get off of the bus, okay? And it's essentially the time that it takes for the doors to open, okay? So now when you look at that compared to this dwell time, you're like, well, wait a minute. They have all door boarding. So how is that, if they have all door boarding and it's taking you 18 seconds and you have three doors, but before you had one door and it was taking you seven seconds, Hmm. Is the ridership really that much higher to warrant that actual increase in loading time? Spoiler, it is. But if you didn't know that about this particular route, then that would actually raise some questions. What is it about this particular platform or this service is causing the, the time per customer to increase? Let's talk about ramp usage, my favorite one. Uh, ramps, okay. Now, if you hear somebody in at our agency talking about lifts, they were from the three years. Although when I was a bus operator, I did drive a bus with an actual physical lift. Okay, we have ramps. Okay, it's a big difference. A lift does take a long time. A ramp flips out and comes back in. Okay. So again, we're looking at this 12 minute headway starting here, and we're seeing that it's taking about a minute and two seconds on average, when we actually have someone that needs to use the ramp, okay? On our buses, we do not purchase them with bridge plates. A uh, bridge plate is similar to what you see on the max. It either flips out or it slides out of the vehicle and it just provides a, uh, enough space to actually just get onto the vehicle. A ramp is long. Those things are like three or four feet long, okay? And they, you have to board through the front door. 
if you have a bridge plate, you can actually put it mid door. Okay. So if you've been to Eugene, you've taken the MX, they have bridge plates uh, on their MX buses. And they do have a ramp at the front, but most people port do the bridge plate. Okay. So again, we have this time here. So we're like, okay, so now it's taking a minute to actually deploy and stow the ramp at each one of these bus stops. That seems kind of high because prior to this, when I did the analysis for FX2, we went out and timed it. We found that a 40 foot bus could deploy and stow the ramp in 30 seconds total. This time is twice that. So again, what about that line is causing this high uh, uh, usage per ramp cycle, right? Is it because of the people boarding? Is it because of how you have to then come in? So if you come in through a bridge plate, you're in the middle of the vehicle. And so now it's, you're a lot closer to the area that you would store, as opposed to coming into the front door, you now have to come around and on our, the FX buses, they have a, uh, it's an auto securing spot for one of the, uh, one of the most areas from mobility devices, it's automatic securing. And it takes time to actually secure it. Is this securement time? Ah, uh, right? The other thing is, is that if you're actually trying to plan service, this is actually a, this is a cost decision to make because bridge plates are faster than ramps, than lifts, ramps, sorry, <laughs> okay? So because bridge plates are faster, now you have to make a, a, a procurement choice, right? Is it cheaper to go out and buy bridge plates or do you actually continue on with the actual ramps? And the other thing is that the buses have near level boarding, which is something that I, that when this project was going, I, I had very strong opinions about that. Because again, the amount of space that you actually have to purchase in order to get level boarding here in Portland, I don't know if anybody's walked down the street, but like our sidewalks are not full. Okay. And so to make them, you know, at that, that grade in order to make them level, you have to buy like that old house to get enough space to build it all the way up. So how much, time do you really gain by going to level boarding or near level boarding? Maybe not much. Uh, last thing, uh, I looked at some operational delays. And so within our service, when we miss service or we lose service, uh, we do actually identify the reason why we have to report it out to the, uh, the Federal Transit Administration. So one of the areas that I'm always interested in is when you have a failure, how long does it take for us to put the service back together? Because again, if you're out riding the service, that's really what you want to know is, yes, my bus is on fire, but what time does the next one come? Because that bus being on fire is not my problem. <laughs> Please put the fire out. However, how long are we going to be out here? Okay. And so I can tell the story because it happened to me in service once where it, fine. everybody got off okay. And I actually got the bus safely to the side of the road on division, no less. Inner division right before 16. So you can imagine 40 foot coach. I got that thing to the curve right before the engine went. Good day. Anyways, so when one of the things that I thought was interesting is that when we have these delays, we basically lose a headway. Okay. So when you're looking at vehicle reliability, operator attendance, operators starting on time, operators actually make, meeting their relief operator and providing that service. If any of that thing, any of those steps fail, we're losing a headway's worth of service. And so perhaps as a transit agency, you have to think differently when that thing fails, how are we going to respond? Because 12 minutes matters. And if you're running a 12 minute headway and you lose a 12 minute headway in between, now you're basically at twice the distance to the customer that they now have to wait, okay? This one is interesting. That, okay, so we don't really lose a headway. But this one down here at the bottom, I thought was also interesting. Because if you're running a 15 minute service, now you're losing even more service on top of that. Which suggests there might actually be some other issues with our operation because you, you shouldn't be losing that much time. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I already typed to these points. So again, when we lose, uh, when we have delay, we lose the entire headway. Uh, and so what this means is that as an agency, if you don't want to lose that headway, what would be helpful is if we could predict that the failures were going to occur. And then you can have buses staged throughout the area of the metro region. And when you do have that failure, you don't lose the entire headway. Okay. We do this at TriMet. Uh, we have buses that actually they park all over the city. Sometimes you'll see them. 
uh, with just you know an operator standing there with the radio. Those are our extra service buses, and what they're doing is actually making sure that uh, we maintain service for these vehicles. So, make it perfect time. So I put it all together, and essentially this is what uh, how this all shakes out. And so now, instead of saying seventy five percent on time. Now we can say, well, wait a minute, we're running a 12 minute headway and on average, we're about, we're getting close to that five minute threshold. So we might want to figure out how could we maybe bring this to two and a half minutes, right? And through these other steps, now you can come through and say, well, wait a minute, we spent, this is hypothetical, we spent millions of dollars on this new fancy uh, lift technology. And we're noticing that it's actually causing us to dwell at stops even longer. What can we do, right? Maybe we do go back and buy that house and then make it all level 40. So that way you don't have to use a uh, ramp or a bridge plate at all, okay? Maybe there's something going on at these particular stops. You have all door boarding, but everybody boards through the front door, okay? So maybe our marketing campaign needs to do a better job of actually explaining that you can board through any door. It's a lot, right, to actually bring that time down. What else is missing? Yeah, it's Catherine. Well, I figure that the planners are probably interested in ramp use because it creates like, um, I don't know, a stack of a time difference. The, as, as a writer, the other thing I experience that seems to have a similar impact is uh, whether a bicycle is secured at a, at a stop service or not. But I don't know, um, like a if data exists to kind of quantify the variation in that phenomenon, or if it's part of the guess and check. Yep. So that would be guess and check. So we do uh, we don't have data on when the actual uh, bus, the bike rack on the front of the bus actually goes down. Uh, there were a series, I won't tell the story, it doesn't matter. But anyways, we don't actually have data or know when uh, there's a bicycle. It's just interesting because for FX in particular, they have started a new bike securement technology. It's too bad we can't measure the return on investment for that. Um, if it's all right, I have a quick question about the ramp dwell. Sure. Is that like the average dwell for any stop service that included the deployment of a ramp or is it like a separate stops start measurement related to like a mechanical mm -hmm. thing. No, so this is this is a stop this so basically this is dwell time no no ramp dwell time with ramp. So there's still passenger activity that's going on here, right? And so this sure you guys might come back and say, well wait a minute Miles, if you subtract that number from that number it gets closer to 30. That could be true. Well, we don't know that. That's something that we have to go guess and check, is what is the big difference between these types of stops? Other mitigations, I've talked about these. Some of these were actually applied to FX2. Others are talked about for other projects. Uh, I think I've, I've made it clear my stance on bridge plates. I think they're great. Uh, stop spacing, this is a big one, right? So in the earlier I said that you know if you have your you know continuum appears on time performance, if you get rid of stops, that's less times the operator has to stop that vehicle. And so now, yes, your boarding time per stop might increase, but your running time decreases because now you can actually get up to an appropriate speed between each stop. Uh, transit signal priority, that's always a fun one that people like to throw out. Let's just throw TSP and everything, just get everything TSP and everybody will get the priority. Okay, so when you have two high frequency routes that intersect, who gets the priority? <laughs> when you have multiple buses in a queue together, who gets the priority, right? Is it the bus at the back that pushes the other buses through the intersection? But you only have one space on the other side of the intersection for one bus. How does that work, right? Uh, equipment selection. This will become very important uh, for transit agencies, especially on the other side of COVID. Do you always need to run a 40 foot coach? Can you run a smaller coach? Smaller buses are more maneuverable, which means that when you're trying to deliver service, you can get into areas that makes it difficult or makes it longer to actually provide 40 foot service. Uh, what else? Think about there. 
right there. Questions? Yes. Uh, so, uh, my question is regarding like, well, me as a user that I don't own a car in Portland, generally when I approach, for example, when I come to the bus to in the morning, uh, I don't really care as a user too much of the on-time performance because I just essentially look to my phone and see what it's done. But uh, sometimes what I have experienced is that uh, it's super annoying is that the bus is going too fast and then uh, we suddenly stop five minutes in a stop. So, um, and this is kind of like the reference with like the airlines that they are always on time because for a flight of one hour, they put a two hour window, right? So I think that what happened also as we know the traffic is not essentially like deterministic. Uh, we usually, I think that the, the speeds between stops are kind of like very conservative. So many times there's no traffic, they go faster and then they have to stop. So how, and, and especially this is in frequent series because of course, if I have like a bus an hour, I might be more focused on the on-time performance, right? But how you deal with like, we want also like user, we want to be faster to get to, I don't care if the window is like 30 minutes, there's no traffic, I don't want to just be nothing, right? So how you deal with like, we want to move, faster, the faster than we can, the people, but also we have to be on the performance of the schedule that maybe the user doesn't care too much. Yes, it's a very good question. So there are trade-offs and uh, you have to make trade-offs uh, in this industry. So if the bus runs, so you can always adjust running time, right? So I can always take running time away from you and that prevents buses from dwelling. However, if the service is too fast, no one can use it. And so that's the balance that you essentially have. In front of my house, buses dwell. And they dwell because there's a time point down the street and they cannot arrive at that time point early. And so they dwell for okay, two minutes in front of my house, maybe twice an hour, okay? I can say, hey, please take this two minutes out of the schedule, okay? Sure, that might solve the problem, however, what might end up happening, though, is that now when that bus approaches that time point, say, for instance, now they have 15 seconds that they have to lay over. So the operator says, okay, great. I'll just lay over at this stop, which is at an intersection, for like 15 additional seconds. Then somebody comes from behind and slams into the back of that bus. And so now I'm here. I lose an entire headway. And so that is the pool that you have. If you give the operators too much time, you have to give them a safe place to get out of traffic. At the same time, you don't want the service to be so fast that no one can actually use the service. And so that is the, the push and pull that we basically go through to figure out where is, and I'm saying this on behalf of Luke, who actually does this for a living, I just process the data, but that is the balance that we actually have to negotiate between the two. Me personally, I don't like early buses. And I don't like early buses because it ends up turning into one of these, right? Sometimes, and I've done this analysis in the past where you have a bus that's running two minutes early and they get into a collision or somebody come, comes by and hits their vehicle. And I argue that while it's not the operator's fault, the bus is in the wrong location at that time. If the bus had been a minute behind, that collision likely would not have occurred. And so that is the, the balance that you basically have to strike between the two. That's the best answer I can give. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we have a, a question from the online audience. Um, so they ask, what are the benefits of using your time-based definition instead of excess waiting time? I mean, you, they, I, it, I think they serve two. So an excess wait time is, it, it depends. I would argue that there's some context that has to be considered, right? So excess wait time, right, is, you know, basically, when the bus does not, if I remember correctly, the bus does not arrive at a certain time, how much time do the people have to wait additionally for that vehicle to arrive? If I'm in San Diego and it's in the middle of summer, that two minutes I might not care about. If I live in Minnesota <laughs> and it's in the middle of December, yeah, I do care about excess wait time. And so what I would, I would argue is that 
Both of them are important, but the context of the two actually matters. I propose this more for practitioners, right? This is a diagnostic tool for us to go back and say, which part of the line or where do we need to focus efforts to get the range closer to where we want it to be? Excess wait time is more of a contextual thing, right? And so during the winter time, when it's raining here, I don't want to excess wait because I don't want to get wet. But other times of the year, uh, maybe not so much. So it, for me, it's really about the context of why you're using the measure. Ask that question. Yes. Yes. I, I was trying to formulate this better, but I'll jump in. So what about moving, especially when you're talking about a six minute headway or these less than 10 minute headways, what about moving away from schedules altogether and just saying this bus operates on a six minute headway and no schedule? You could. Yeah, that is that is a way of actually running the service. The It does require more people though. That's one thing, right? Because around a six minute headway, you essentially have to count. Well, a six minute headway with or without a schedule sure. is the same number of operators and buses, right? I'm sorry, I was thinking about it in context from going from a oh, 12 to a six. Sure. But yeah. You could. Well, and I guess I raise it because going back to, you know, more and more people, if you're just using an app, like I couldn't tell you what my bus schedule is because all I ever do is just check my app and it tells me and I figure out how long it's going to take me to get to the stop. I have no idea what the schedule is. So I wonder at what at, at one at some point schedules matter. Sure, if, you, if you're running a frequency high enough that no one really needs a, like if you're running six minute reliable service, then no, a schedule would not matter. Uh, only ex except for in the case when a, that six minute vehicle doesn't work. And so, as I said before, that you run, there's always that balance. Is that sure? We can run at a six minute headway, but the minute one of those operators starts to drag, you either have to insert another vehicle in order to maintain that headway, or you have to drag the entire line down. This though would still be relevant though, because now I can actually look at it and say at this six minute headway, on average, how close am I actually getting to that, which allows you to evenly space the buses out there. Now, it's funny because when I originally started this, I actually was like, well, the general public would be able to use this. And I was like, how? Like, who's going to, you're correct. Who's going to sit there and, okay, so this is bus is going to arrive plus or minus three minutes. Okay, I'm going to, yes, I'm going to try to make that bus. Right, most people are like, bus is coming. <laughs> I must go catch it. Yeah, because as the per the person trying to get there also has their window of like, well, you know, I want to make sure they're X minutes early or you know, this whatever. And if you have a connection, then it becomes even more important because you want to make sure you catch the right bus to actually be able to make your catch connection on time. Yes. Is there data for the FX on the train delays and the route and how that impacts what is expected? Yes, there is data. I haven't analyzed it, but it is it is an analysis request to actually understand what impact the uh, railroad, railroad crossing is at uh, 11 to 12 or 7 uh, or in the actual FX running time. Um, if you don't get caught in that, the on-time performance is great. But when you have to go on the, the reroute, the on-time performance isn't very great. So I have to look. It's on the list of things to analyze. <laughs> this is a question based on um, not the practitioner viewpoint, but the runner viewpoint. And it's interesting at uh, the line I take and work. I can't, I don't know why, but lately it's been running late almost every single morning, but it's hard to plan for that because like maybe I'm calling my hairbrush and do whatever. And I like my Google Maps will say like, yeah, 70 is at like DCAM and it, it'll be here in 20 minutes. And I think I am going to comb my hair. And but then because the bus operator is like trying to get back on schedule, 
Then I check back in like 10 minutes and now my app says like, it's going to be in three minutes. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to make that. And this happens a lot. So um, it's, it's kind of interesting how it seems like from that perspective, there's a trade-off between like a predictable pace because that's what a lot of apps use to give um, predictions and, and uh, trip navigation support. But, uh, you know, like Google Maps doesn't know about like what TriMet's on-time performance metrics are and, and that a bus operator might have gotten around like a logistical pinch point specific to Portland and is actually going to be able to make up that time. Um, so it's, it's kind of an interesting intersection between like how our um, general trends of view, like data is used by other parties and how and the customer experience and then also like the expectations and metrics that uh, bus operators and their derivatives are, are working from. And if you have any like thoughts about that, I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, uh, sometimes you're late. And uh, so at TriMet, we have a couple different ways that we can try to get buses back on time. Uh, one of them is uh, we have what's called drop off only mode. So you see the bus and say drop off only. Uh, the operator pulls up, you have to wait for the next bus, bus keeps going, right? In practice, if people are standing at the bus stop, just get on. If the doors are open, get on the bus. I'll tell you that right now. This is a story in life. If the door is open and you need to get through it, go to the door. Don't wait, just go. That's why the door is open. Anyways, so we can put buses on drop off only, right? And so that allows the operators to basically skip intending customers to actually try to get back on schedule. There are other times where we might actually just take the bus and just say, it's go to this particular part of the route and then just continue service, right? So if you have uh, a re an FX2 reroute is a great example. You're stuck behind the reroute or you're on the reroute. Well, we have another bus that's actually on its appropriate headway. Let them go in front of you and then that bus will actually follow behind. Or we'll say, just go out to 82nd and continue service from 82nd. Leave your customers there and the bus behind you will just pick them up, right? That's how we actually try to manage uh, the service when we have those particular issues. It does mean every now and then we do have a phantom bus that gets inserted and it causes transit tracker to suddenly say, oh yeah, the bus is here. But it happens. Yeah, thanks. That's interesting. Yes, thank you. There's a, two quick questions. First one, I know you said because the table was going to be too large, but I'm curious at the 12 minute uh, scheduled headway, you have 66,000 passengers. Like, at what hours normally would that, would you say in the day, does that mostly occur? Is it random or like you have a, I don't know, from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m., you will say, does the, is, you know, when is it 12 minute schedule mostly occurring? I think that's one of the questions. I have to look, but I believe it's between 7 a.m. and like 8 p.m. So, sorry, sorry. 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. in that, in that range. So, okay. And just uh, the second one, the, the, in terms of the delay or the average, and um, like you said about when they, they want to far ahead, they have to stop. Just wondering, technically, like the process is you're, you're telling the operator, hey, stop now because you're ahead of time, like literally, and that's why he does that has happened to me more than I am new to Portland and I can just be writing the service. And but it happens a lot that the buses are ahead, I imagine, and um, the driver stops. In the same stop, like he stays, he or she stays, stays there. But it's uh, like I just wonder. Like sometimes it's I've been one minute, I've been five minutes, which I thought was well, this is too long. But I'm wondering, like the process, like literally, you guys uh, back at the office say, hey, you gotta stop because we're behind of schedule and just stop right now. And actually, once I saw a change in shift, which was interesting because it took like ten minutes because I think the other driver was a bit late. Uh, uh, like, just want to bring the process like physically like, so okay so i will quote the policy so the policy at tribe states that you are not allowed to arrive at a time point more than 59 seconds earlier provided that you left the previous time point on time 
So if you are going to arrive more than 59 seconds earlier to that time point, you have to pull over before you get to that time point. So if you pull in, you're already early. You have to lay for time before you actually get to that time point. However, there are some parts in Portland where it's not safe to do that, right? So on the old two, 12th and Division was a time point. 12th and Division was also the number one location we had mirror strikes. It's also a relief point for operators. If you go back west to 7th, where can you safely lay over a bus for two minutes? Not a lot of places. If you go east, there is nowhere to lay over a bus, right? You'd be at uh, Philip, De Neary, Philip Neary at that point, right? Over on 16th, if you can find a space, right? And so what the operator does is that they do have a clock and it will tell them, you know, you're basically, you're running ahead. And so at that point, it actually shows up in red. And so it'll give a countdown as to when the operator can go. If the operator is running excessively early, then yeah, our dispatch will contact the operator and tell them that they need to uh, basically lay for time and then they'll tell them when to go. But the majority of it, it's done through computer, right? It's actually the operator that's lame. Yes. I'll go ahead and try to combine a number of questions. Okay. Um, there's some questions on the uh, chat about technology. So people are wondering how do new bus technologies like electric buses affect it? How do the 60 foot buses versus the 40 foot and how to hop cars, all these little technical so hop speeds has definitely sped up uh, boarding time because you no longer have to flash a pass or pay cash and so uh i haven't looked recently but the, the dwell time just for a, a tap has gone down uh, for one um i don't the technology of a 60 foot bus okay with they're more into the question I think they're just wondering how all of these things affect on-time performance and, and dwell time. So the 60-foot bus, one, it would have, uh, sometimes would have a longer dwell because on FX2, there are fewer stops. And so we would expect to see some increase in dwell time, but they also have all-door boarding as opposed to our 40-foot uh, buses. They do not have all-door boarding. And so there's, would I would see an increase. I don't know if I would see an increase that much, um, but I would expect there to be, through some stop consolidation, an increase in boarding time. Um, anecdotally, when there was stop spacing done on the 15 between Chavez and the 20th, uh, we actually saw that the stop right there on 36th headed westbound. The bus there suddenly like was dwelling for 30 seconds, where it previously didn't. Well, it's because the two jet stops adjacent to it had actually been collapsed. And so we still did see ridership go up. But what happened was that because those other stops didn't exist, the buses are running two minutes early by the time they got to 12. And so now it was like, okay, so where do you have the bus layover? Because we've taken the stops out to speed up the service, which is great, but now we don't actually have a safe place for the bus to go. So those are some of the, the trade-offs. Um, TSP, I don't know if it's completely active at this point, but I will probably redo this analysis to look at the impacts of uh, TSP. I've seen it help. I've also seen it hurt. Um, it, it really just depends on uh, what service you're actually operating that day. Is there, is there evidence to show that um, dwell time per boarding passenger is generally um, less on articulated buses with multi-door boarding? Or has, is that uh, inconclusive? I haven't done that research lately here at TriMet, but from the Muni study, so San Francisco Muni, they did a study which swayed me to convince FX2 to go all door boarding. But they're like, they went from like 11 seconds per stop to like five seconds per stop when they instituted uh, all door boarding. And their transit speed, I think, actually hit double digits. So like Muni's transit speed before was like eight miles per hour. Then afterwards, it was like 10 or 11 miles per hour. TriMet's is 12 and a half miles per hour. So it did actually speed up the service once they went to it. Yes. You made a comment earlier about early buses, or my interpretation of your comment was that early buses are more likely to have some sort of incident that would cause a delay. So why why is that? Or why? 
I'm trying to figure out the cause and effect. So philosophically, it's because I argue uh, it's because the bus is in the wrong location at the wrong time. So if you're running two minutes early, and there's a you, you're thinking like in the future there's a collision coming two minutes away. Right. And so if I'm now running two minutes early, I'm now in that path to hit this thing. If I had was two minutes later, then we probably would not have actually intersected at that time. And so what I have found, I used to review a lot of collisions that buses that ran early would get hit in locations where I'm like, hmm, you don't have a safe place to pull that bus over because you're early. And that's why you're now getting into this particular collision. You're taking off a mirror off of a car. A car is coming by and hitting your mirror, or they're running into the back of you. And so it's really more about the fact that when you run early, there's fewer places for you to put that bus because of the fact that you're not where you're supposed to be based on how we actually wrote the schedule. So it's that needing to, to get back on schedule Correct. part of it. That's okay. Correct. That makes sense. And in, in that same line of thought, like, have you thought about maybe sometimes? The cost of being on time is generating more pressure than so maybe yeah. yep and that's one of the things that, that uh, we're going to look at as well is the what is the cost to actually being that much early when you start to factor in collisions and complaints and all those other factors that then uh, lead to the service degrading so there is a cost to being early uh, the other thing is that early operators sometimes speed and speeding is correlated with collisions so with that, let's thank our speaker.